You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Tonight we are here in Old Brick enjoying good food and good fellowship, unlike the 60 million refugees and displaced persons worldwide. If you've been watching the news, you may have seen, as I did last evening, that, that yesterday 2,000 more migrants arrived in Greece. There are approximately 30,000 migrants there who are traveling through Greece trying to reach other destinations in Europe. We're very much aware of the migrant crisis in Europe, but there are also refugee crises in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And all of these people on the move, all of these people who are fleeing oppression and war, are part of the largest refugee crisis since World War II. And most of the people who are fleeing from war and oppression are women and children and their proportion of the total number of migrants is growing all the time. This annual event is called Night of a Thousand Dinners, which is sort of a funny name, and it, it, it is actually an old name, uh, at least two decades old. Uh, originally, this event was part of a national program to raise money for landmine clearance, and so the idea was that across the country, there would be a thousand dinners. Well, the landmine clearance program disappeared, but here in Iowa City, we kept on observing Night of a Thousand Dinners, and we transformed it into a celebration of International Women's Day. International Women's Day is March 8th. It's an observance that began about a century ago in Europe, and it's now celebrated around the world, and it takes very many forms. Here tonight, given the, the worldwide refugee crisis and the preponderance of women and children among the migrants, we concluded that this year our observance of International Women's Day would focus on refugee women, their challenges, their courage, their resourcefulness as they care for families in conditions that, that we cannot imagine. Iowa UNA is proud to be the initiating organization, and as I mentioned, we are especially grateful and proud that over 25 campus and community organizations and businesses are co-sponsors of this event, and they're listed on the back of your program, as I mentioned. Thanks to the generosity of our co-sponsors, we have already raised hundreds of dollars, which will be sent to the UN Refugee Agency, and in addition, proceeds from ticket sales will support the educational work <clears throat> of the Iowa UNA. Well, I want to thank you and especially Jim Olson for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And how about the dinner that we've been provided tonight? Is this fabulous or what? What a treat. So, I understood, no, I understand that we are here to celebrate the achievements of women, to recognize the role of the UN system in advancing the status of women, and to raise funds for the work of the UN system on that topic. Were we here simply to celebrate the achievement of women in Iowa City, my task would be incredibly easy. The list of women to celebrate here is long. How long is it? Very long. Very long. I mean, it's just an enormous list of really uh, tremendous women here in Iowa City. I'm going to mention just a few, starting with Barbara Schlachter. Barbara is a very good friend who recently passed away. As many of you know, she played a crucial role in creating Iowa City Climate Advocates, and creating 100 grannies. I'll bet there are quite a few grannies here tonight. 100 grannies, would you raise your hands, please? There you go. So there are probably 15 here. <laughs> uh, 
Miriam Kashia, would you keep your hand up, please? She's another really outstanding woman I want to draw your attention to. She's a member of one, 100 Grannies who, as I, everybody keeps saying, walked 3,000 miles uh, two years ago across the country with Ed Fallon and, and others to uh, draw attention to the threat that climate change uh, presents to us and to compel us to take effective action. So I want to thank you, Miriam. I want to mention two other women who I don't think are here tonight. One is Royce Ann Porter, an African-American uh, woman who has been a very powerful voice for racial equity in Iowa City for several years. She's uh, really an effective advocate for that topic. And Misty Rebick. How many of you know Misty? All right. Well, Misty's a young woman who, uh, I don't know, four years ago or thereabouts, helped start the Center for Worker Justice. And she did a really fabulous job. She's just retired to do, retired to do something else. <laughs> I don't know what you think of the minimum wage that Johnson County adopted, thanks to Rod Sullivan and many others. I'm a supporter. And I think it wouldn't exist if it hadn't have been for the strong efforts of Misty Rebeck and the members of the Center for Worker Justice, along with the Board of Supervisors who did fabulous work. So I could go on and on. There are so many terrific women who have done brilliant work here. But we are doing more than celebrate worthy women. Tonight we are focusing on refugee women. And your keynote speaker is, my pardons, Zayeka Kravitsa. Close. <laughs> I knew, I, I, I tried. <laughs> uh, a, a Bosnian woman who's from uh, Sarajevo and now lives in Des Moines with her husband right down here. I'm no expert concerning refugees or refugee women in particular, but I have had the opportunity to meet with Congolese and Sudanese women over the past few years, women who are refugees from violence in their home countries. I've met with them in the Broadway Neighborhood Center, the Pheasant Ridge Neighborhood Center, and I've met with several children of Congolese, especially uh, 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 refugees, who are uh, at a, in an uh, English, learning, English language learner class at City High. So, you know, that, that experience has helped me recognize the language and culture, cultural barriers that they face, as well as uh, the rather uh, uh, severe reactions they have received from, from some Iowans due to the color of their skin or to their particular faith. I have nothing but the highest regard for their courage and their efforts. And I know there are at least two Congolese uh, refugees in the back. I'm really happy to see them here. And, and then I sh I'm sure there are others. So anyhow. On behalf of Iowa City City Council, Iowa City government, and maybe in a sense the people of Iowa City, welcome to you all. I hope you have a great event and bravo. So. Thank you, Mayor Throckmorton. We're, we're honored to have you here and thank you so much for bringing greetings. At this time, I'd like to call on uh, one of the vice presidents of the Iowa UNA, Nancy Porter, who will introduce our speaker. Good evening, good evening, and thank you very much. And every woman in this room deserves recognition. Mothers, teachers, you're all doing your part to keep our world a better place, so thank you. It is my honor. <laughs> It is my pleasure and honor, I think, to stand on my tiptoes, no, to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. I first met Zelka Kavavisa in Des Moines a couple of months ago. We were at a table in Panera's and we were brainstorming ideas of programs for the United Nations Association of Iowa and her dynamic personality and her handsome son, just was so much a part of that. I knew from the very beginning that this would be a woman I would 
enjoy being around and hearing from. Well, you've already heard she's from Des Moines. If you look at your program, you can see one of the awards that she was so, um, that she has earned and was recognized. And that award was the 2015 recipient of the White House Champions of Change Award for World Refugees. She's also received the Iowa Council for International Understanding 2010 Passport to Prosperity Award. So this woman came to our country, the United States of America, in 1993. And she, as a refugee, had certainly taken her efforts to get here. But since that time, she's promoted programs for refugees. She's devoted her life to helping other refugees make Iowa home. She knows what all refugees have in common. Regardless of their education or economic background, that is the great sense of loss, loss of life they once knew, loss of loved ones, and loss of dignity. So as, as we uh, welcome uh, Zelka to our, our podium this afternoon, or this evening, I'd like you to know a little bit of what she is currently doing in Des Moines. She's a refugee case manager with the Bureau of Refugee Services in Des Moines. And she's been an Iowa State Delegate with United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. That's also known by the acronym UNHCR, Refugee Congress. She volunteers to teach English as a second language. And we could use all of you right now in Iowa City doing that if you're so interested. She conducts green card clinics for refugees seeking change of status, and she founded Iowa Interpreters and Translators Association. She's also cultural ambassador for Culture All. That's a nonprofit providing cultural diversity workshops and trainings for school children in Iowa. Zelka Kravatsvisi has continually advocated for refugee women's rights and through all kept a positive and grateful attitude. This, she says, she learned from her refugee clients who taught her to look on the bright side and cherish the miracles of this world. So with that, in her own words, please welcome Zelka to the podium. I know, I'm sure too. It's always difficult. Dobro veče. Assalamu alaikum. Merhaba. Buenos dias. Male. These are only a few languages that are spoken around Iowa today. And I think that that's amazing. Just um, two decades ago, when I came as a refugee from Bosnia and Herzegovina, the only lang foreign languages spoken in Des Moines, for example, were Spanish, a little bit of Russian, and some Southeast Asian languages, Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian. No one has ever heard of Kunama. No one has ever heard of Tigrinya. No one has ever heard of uh, Kran or some other languages spoken by refugees that have been arriving to the state of Iowa in the past two decades. I am a refugee. I'm a mother of a refugee child. I'm a sister of a refugee sister. I'm a spouse of a refugee husband. I'm a child of a refugee mother. I'm a co-worker of a refugee co-worker. I'm a friend of a refugee friend. I came to the United States as a refugee from Bosnia 23 years ago. I'm not going to talk about war in Bosnia that brought me here, but I'm going to talk about my experience becoming a refugee and coming to the United States. Refugee program a refugee resettlement program is very complex. And 
each refugee from any part of the world has to go through a very long, stern, and sometimes vicious process of vetting. It's not easy to come to the United States as a refugee, and it's not easy to come to any country in the world in the refugee. You have to qualify, you have to go through medical exams, you have to go through numerous interviews, you have to get a green light from numerous organizations, uh, immigration officers, people who interview you over and over and over again. My husband and I were interviewed uh, in 1993 before coming to the United States, and our interview took a long time. Um, a young girl from Brooklyn was an INS officer at the time, immigration officer at the time, and she asked us many, many questions regarding our status, the reasons why we left Sarajevo, which we were born and raised at. And at the end of our conversation, um, she um, was very generous and very kind, and she said, so do you have any questions for me? And um, being curious where we would go, we asked her about Iowa. We knew at the time that we would be resettled to Iowa, but we didn't know anything about this state. She looked at us very puzzled, and it took her a couple of minutes to concentrate, and then she said, yeah, I know, tomatoes, potatoes, <laughs> hogs. And that's the only thing, th these are the only three things th she mentioned about Iowa. My husband and I realized that we will have to grab a book and go to the library and learn something about the state that will become our home. We lived in the United States before. I served with the Embassy of Yugoslavia in the 80s, and we lived in Washington, D.C. as the members of the diplomatic corps. Went back to Bosnia just before the war. And the reason was that we wanted to vote for the independence of our country. We wanted to be there when historical moment was happening. We want, and we wanted to witness it. We never imagined at that time that we will come back to the United States as refugees. Um, coming to Iowa was a very um, dramatic experience for us, so to say. We left the United States having one child. We came back as refugees with two children. The trip from Sarajevo to Des Moines took us, I think, around 36 hours, and we changed several, um, we, we traveled first by bus, and then by train, and by plane. Uh, we came to Des Moines in 1993, in August, August 4th, just after the floods. And um, on our last flight from St. Louis, we were sitting in the plane, and I was reading an article from Newsweek, telling about horrible flights in Des Moines and uh, meningitis transmitted by mosquitoes. And I was absolutely petrified. I was reading this and thinking to myself, oh my God, we survived the war, we survived the refugee camps, now we are coming to Des Moines, my kids will be bit by a mosquito and they will get meningitis. This is the end of the world. Uh, we, were, um, we were put in the apartment um, in the middle of the sorority fraternity houses in the Drake area in Des Moines. Uh, it was a nice furnished apartment and for us it, it was a castle, it was so beautiful. And I started working the next day with the Bureau of Refugee Services as a case manager. Um, I actually was recruited by the state of Iowa while I was in a refugee camp in Croatia because when they got our bios, they realized that both my husband and I speak English and they needed someone to help with Bosnian refugees who were already here who spoke the language. Um, as I said before, I didn't know anything about Iowa except that just before coming here, I read two books written by Jane Smiley. One was A Thousand Acres, and uh, I absolutely loved the book and everything, but uh, it, was, it was the knowledge that was not a typical everyday knowledge of everyday life in Iowa. It was a little bit beyond that. So... Um, when we came, uh, we really felt 
in a way as home, but also very far away from home. And that's something what Nancy was saying. Working with refugees um, for the past 20, over 20 years, I learned that even though there are tremendous differences among refugee populations, there are very many similarities. And one of the most important similarity is the sense of loss. No matter where the refugees come from, uh, which social strata they come from, uh, what is their education, did they have great or lousy jobs back home, did they even work, or did they come from luxurious housing or horrible refugee camps, did they have uh, horrible experiences or not that bad experiences, they all come with a sense of loss, loss of their families, loss of their belongings, loss of their jobs, loss of the life that you have, and loss of dignity. So for me, when I started working with uh, Bureau of Refugee Services, it was very important to help the refugees that I have been working with. It was very important to show them that I do understand what they went through, it was very important to show them that I'm there to help them and I'm not there to judge them. And very often in return, I get this um, feeling of gratefulness from my client. Very often people ask me, what are the most memorable experiences of your work with refugees? What are, what are the moments that you will always remember? And there are many, many of them but I would say that two of them stand out. One of them is uh, when I was working with a um, young Burmese family that came from a refugee camp in Thailand, um, and the wife was pregnant. When she delivered her baby, they named their baby by me. And for me, that was um, everything. That was um, a talking of appreciation. That was a talking of someone from a far, far away and different culture, different experience, different customs, telling me, we appreciate you and you, we appreciate what you have done for us. The second um, very important experience that I uh, had working as a case manager was working with my people, with the people from Bosnia, with Bosnian women especially. Um, in 1994, in Bosnia, in a tiny village of Srebrenica, 8,124 young men and boys were killed in three days just because they were Muslim. Their mothers, their sisters, their wives, their grandmothers were resettled among other countries to the United States. And I was the case manager that worked with the first groups of Bosnian women that came from that part of Bosnia. Um, for me, it was very, very difficult to comprehend that a mother can live knowing that she will never see her sons again. For a wife, who witnessed a cruel um, killing of her husband, of her brothers, of her father, to be able to continue on daily, with, with a daily life. I, I, it was beyond me uh, to understand how, can, how is it possible? What is this strength that a woman has to go through it and to continue living for some other uh, aim? These women um, were very, very um, quiet when they came. They were extremely unhappy. They did not want to work with anyone. They were just um, staying within their circles. They do not, didn't want to open to any services that we were offering them. And it took some time for us to um, introduce some mental health programs to them. Uh, counseling, home visits, medications in many cases. And once it, it, uh, the, the program started and we had a few of them uh, joining the program, the others gradually started coming to us asking for help. 
And I personally think that the mental health program for Bosnian women that was, um, I think it was in effect for probably five to six years, saved many, many lives. And many of these women became big advocates for mental health help. They became big advocates for other women from other cultures that they met through their mosques or their churches to help them go through the program and get some additional help if they needed. Um, whenever I think about women and my clients that I have been serving, I um, cannot but um, mention several of them that I will never forget, and they defined my life in a way. I will never forget my Burmese client that came to the United States as a refugee from Thailand, uh, a middle-aged woman that was born and raised in a refugee camp in the middle, middle of a jungle uh, that has never experienced anything else in her life but that camp. And when she came to Des Moines through our agency, she started attending English as a second language classes. We taught her how to ride a bus and she was the happiest person in the world. For the first time in her life, she could actually leave her home and feel safe. And one day I got a call from a teacher in the church where she was going for English um, uh, classes, telling me that this woman did not come to school and that for several days and that she's very worried. So I went and visited her. It was November, late November, beginning of December. She was at home, very sad. I talked to her through the interpreter and she said, yeah, I'm not coming to school. And I said, why, what's going on? She said, I don't know how to walk in shoes. She has never walked in shoes before. She has always been either barefoot or in her flip-flops. So her barrier for success that we say, for self-sufficiency that we say in official language of Department of Human Services was not being able to walk in winter shoes. I will always remember my Bhutanese client, a young woman that came from a refugee camp in Nepal with her severely disabled mother and her grandmother, and uh, she was a caretaker for both of them. Very young, very smart, very ambitious, dreaming of becoming a teacher. And when we offered her some classes through local community college, she, she, she refused. Though her English was very good, she said, no, 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 no. My first goal and my first task in life is to take care of my parents, of my mom and my grandma. And when they feel comfortable, when they feel safe, when I take care of them in a proper way, then I can take care of myself. And that's what happened. Her mom got disability benefits, her grandmother got aged benefits through the state of Iowa, and this girl in a couple of years was able to go to school and today she is working as a Bhutanese outreach worker with the Moines Public Schools. There is an Eritrean woman who uh, is Tigrinya. She came as a single mother with several children, did not know a word of English, uh, was struggling tremendously to keep her family afloat. With the assistance from the state and different agencies, she was able to find a job, go to school. She mastered English enough to help our office as an interpreter. Tigrinya is a very rare language. It's a very obscure lang language, and it's very difficult to find interpreters. And this woman offered her help and explained it in a way that Iowa saved my life, and this office saved my life. It's time for me to give back. And I'm going to help you as much as you need me. When you don't need me anymore, that's okay. There is a, an Iraqi client that I have been working with for a long time. She was a playwright back in Iraq. And her dream is to write a play about Iraqi refugees in Iowa. She's now working a night shift 
in a local manufacturing company, but she doesn't want to change the night shift. She doesn't want to do the day shift because she says, during the night, when I work the night shift, everything's quiet, I have some peace, and I can think about my play. I, have all, I, I already have a lot of things in my head, and I'm just waiting for the right time to put it on paper. Whenever I uh, do presentations or workshops, or even when I was in a White House, that was a big honor, and I really felt extremely grateful, and I appreciated um, the recognition. But I always say I want to, to share that with the people that I work with, because without them, I will probably not be here. Without them, my life will be very, very different than it is. Without them, I will probably not, I would never have learned that small miracles can change your life. And uh, through my clients, um, I am forever changed. Um, today, at this moment, 32,000 people are refugees. And as Jim mentioned, 60 million people in the world are refugees. 55% of them are women and children. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible, horrible world crisis. Never ever after the Second World War has a uh, world had uh, more refugees than today. Um, I know that many of us um, think, how can I help? What is it that I can do? Um, do they need money? Do they? Um, anything will. Anything will uh, work. Any kind of help. And my friends from Congolese community here in Cedar Rapids, who were just recently in Des Moines, we were discussing the issues. And every single refugee population has the same issues: English, employment, childcare, transportation. There are barriers that every community comes across. So if you have some free time, if you have, some, if you have a wish to help people who are less fortunate and who uh, did not choose to become refugees, uh, and they did not sit at their homes and plan the refugee resettlement, they did not say, well, we would like to be resettled to Des Moines, Iowa, let's go there. Uh, Refugee uh, resettlement is something that's very, very different than immigration, and I'm not going to talk about that tonight, and I presume that most of them, most of you know the difference. But refugee, you become a refugee, and it can, help, it can happen to anyone. Uh, I have never dreamt that I will become a refugee. And as I said, come back to the United States, the country that I once lived very luxuriously in and, 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 and you know, in, in the most important city in the world, so to say. But um, Iowa is home. Iowa has been very open and very friendly and very receptive to refugees from all over the world. I cannot say that we had a lot of incidents where people were judging someone else by the color of their skin or their religion or the language or uh, customs. Uh, at least in Des Moines, there are many communities that really uh, go out there and help refugees as, as much as they can. So I hope that you will find also some time and some willingness and some passion to help the people who need it. Um, one of the things that I also want to mention is that um, when I look, um, uh, when I watch the TV and, uh, and listen to uh, different comments about people who are different and who come from different parts of the world, no matter if they're refugees or immigrants, I really, really do get very upset. and I always say, I'm a refugee, but I'm an American as well, and very proudly so. And I truly hope that this country will live, live up to its values, to, that it proclaims. Respect to the others, acceptance of the others, 
and assistance to the others. So hopefully that will happen for the future of all these young people here and of us that are looking into old and golden age. But America has been, uh, and Iowa especially, has been very um, open to refugee program. Iowa has a very, very successful, long refugee resettlement program that started with Governor Ray. And um, I don't know how many of you know about that program, but Governor Ray was the only governor in the 70s that accepted Southeast Asian refugees. When the people from Vietnam and um, Cambodia and Laos left their countries, they came to France and they were regarded as boat people. And the French government told them that they cannot stay there. This is just temporary, you have to leave. And they didn't know where to go. So um, an American scholar who was helping them suggested that they should write a letter to each and every governor of the United States and ask the governors to accept them. And Governor Ray was the only one that said yes. And I think it's pretty big. I really think that Iowa has to be, we have to talk about that at every single meeting and every single gathering when we talk about history of Iowa. Because that happened 40 years ago. And the doors were opened for Southeast Asians, and since then, many other uh, refugees have been coming to this state. So young boys and girls in this room, remember this and continue with the legacy. Thank you very much. I appreciate. And while you're uh, writing your questions and while we're collecting them, I'll start with the first question. So we've heard a lot about <clears throat> Syrian refugees, and I wondered if you could say something about, are there Syrian refugees now in Iowa, or what, what's, what is the um, status of that refugee group in Iowa? Um, unfortunately, there are no Syrian refugees in Iowa yet. Hopefully, um, they might be coming in 2017. Uh, the process of uh, Syrian resettlement uh, to the United States has been um, very long, and uh, many states are actually waiting to start with resettlement program. There are some Syri Syrian refu refugees who are resettled to the eastern uh, states, but not to Midwest or any other states uh, in the United States. Um, as you, I, I don't want to go into very uh, many details about Syrian refugee resettlement, but it has been a very unfortunate and uh, very sad story, and hopefully uh, it will change very soon. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm from Bosnia, too, but I just met this woman one time. Um, I wanted to tell you that I work for American Red Cross, and American Red Cross in Des Moines has one program, it's called Linkage. So which means if you know any one refugees, there's a couple of them Syrian in Cedar Rapids. They, they lost the connection with the families. You just have to call us in a Des Moines Red Cross because there is a couple, there is a bunch of volunteers that are trying to help internationally to connect the families. Um, especially people who are like Jelka and me, we lost the contact, so we know exactly how that works. Everything is confidential, but by any chance, if you meet somebody who lost the connection with their family, even in Syria or Middle East or anywhere where is war affected, so I just want to provide you that information to call American Red Cross. Thank you. That's, that's just, just to clarify, that's the American Red Cross in Des Moines, is that correct? Yeah, yes. Okay. The question is, is there any provision for settled refugees to return to their home country? Does it happen often? Um, the last time it happened was with the refugees from Kosovo. And it happened, I think, in 1997, 
when the refugees from Kosovo who were in Iowa were, and other states uh, around the country were offered provisions to go back to their home countries. I do not know that there are any other uh, refugee groups that were offered provisions to go back to their countries, and some of them, um, of course, are not able to go back like Iraqis or majority of African refugees and Asian refugees that we work with right now. So, so we have a two-part question. What percent of refugees are refugees because of war? war? And what percent of the U.S. discretionary budget is devoted to war? I think that must be the defense budget. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I really don't know the answer to the questions. I, um, I do not want to guess. I really don't. And I, I do not know um, the answer to the question. I just want to mention with the, when we were talking about percentage that even though for... Um, the people in the United States and Europe, uh, with all the new influx of Syrian and Afghani refugees, it seems that every single Syrian and Afghani refugee is coming to Europe or the United States. That's not true. A very small percentage of refugees in total are coming to Europe and especially to the United States at this moment. Uh, what else can we... Uh, what specifically can we do to encourage our leaders to accept more refugees into this country, especially Syrians? To vote for the right person for the President of the United States? <laughs> I really do think so. Um, we, um, as Jim was saying, we really need to... Um, talk to our senators and our congressmen and our mayors and the people who are making decisions to uh, support the refugee program. It's not easy. And um, there are agencies in the United States, like United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, Lutheran Social Services, World Relief, Catholic Charities, agencies that have been working with refugees for decades and doing a great job. And people are open to accepting refugees. Refugees bring with themselves, they bring diversity, they bring new workforce, they bring so many good and positive things. And all the stories that, you know, refugees are criminals and they do the, this or that are absolutely untrue. There are no statistics to support that. Um, uh, Iowa has formed in Des Moines, there is a, um, a body that's called um, Iowa Refugee Alliance. And we um, formed uh, two years ago. We have several subcommittees that uh, address different fields like education and health, employment, transportation, and some others. So if you are interested, you can always contact me, and Jim has my contact information. I have some um, business cards as well, and there are ways that we can suggest to you how to um, address uh, uh, right people with the right issues at the right time. But most importantly, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir in Iowa City, most importantly, vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jelka, this has been just a wonderful evening. Uh, we're so grateful to you and your husband for coming from Des Moines and being with us and sharing your experience, inspiring us, and also uh, provoking us into how we, we can do more to, uh, to, to welcome refugees here in Iowa and to help with their relief wherever they may be. So thank you so much. And let's give Jalka another round. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. You're watching City Channel 4 on TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.